stories are the most powerful thing on earth. They are literally life and death. Wars are waged based on the story of who is the hero and who is the villain. You are the result of a story your parents told each other. The one night stand, the soulmate, and friends who became so much more. Life and death. So wouldn't you like to understand them better, these stories? How Story Works, an elegant guide to the crafts of storytelling by Lonnie Diane Rich, demystifies stories and helps you understand why you love what you love, why you hate what you hate, and why prologues are almost always a bad idea. How Story Works by Lonnie Diane Rich. Available on Amazon in ebook, audiobook, and paperback form. Get your copy today. Welcome to Still Pretty, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer podcast from Chipperish Media. I'm story expert and ex-vengeance demon in a bunny suit, Lonnie Diane Rich. And I'm film scholar with womanless arms, Noelle LaCroix. And we're here today to talk about Fear Itself, the fourth episode of season four. Fear Itself aired on October 26, 1999. It was written by David Fury and directed by Tucker Gates. As you all know by now, this is a fully spoiled Buffy podcast. So if you're spoiler sensitive, watch the whole show. Come on back. We'll be here when you're done. (laughs) You've got problems? Solve them on your own time. All right, let's go on patrol. In fear itself, the gang is getting ready for another fun Halloween, but Buffy's depression over Parker keeps her from getting into the spirit. She's pretty sure that Giles is going to want her to patrol anyway. I I see. Is there some uh, specific danger you you, you were sensing? No. You know, but then we were all caught off guard when Ethan turned everyone into their customs. True, but but what happened then was anomalous. Creatures of the night shy away from Halloween. They, They find it all much too crass. Little likelihood of any supernatural activity tonight. Anya comes to visit Xander to move their relationship forward, and he invites her to the Halloween frat party, telling her to get a scary costume. He and Oz go to the frat to help them with their sound system, and the guys are sparing no detail in making the place as scary as possible, even painting a mystical symbol on the floor and filling a bowl full of peeled grapes. Eyeballs, man. Blindfold chicks. Have them put their hands in the bowl and tell them it's eyeballs. They love that. And here I was wasting time buying him flowers and complimenting them on their shoes. When Xander is the voice for respecting women, does that mean we're officially in a bizarro world? Anyway, when Oz fixes the sound system with his knife, he cuts himself and bleeds onto the symbol on the floor and a rubber spider becomes real. So that's not good. Buffy is still recovering from Parker, but decides to go to the party as Little Red Riding Hood. She meets Xander, Willow, and Oz, and they go to the party, but things are weird. Nobody's around. There are real spiders and real blood on the floor. Bats attack, but then fall to the ground as toys. It's made of rubber. What the hell is going on here? Look, maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's just a neat trick. You know, something done with wires or... Or it might be something else. Anya shows up to the house dressed in the scariest costume she could find, a bunny suit. But the door doesn't exist anymore. She sees a girl screaming in a window, but then the house closes over the window. So she goes to get Giles. In the frat house, Buffy and the Scoobies try to leave, but they can't find the door. They do find a frat boy hiding in the closet, however, and he tells them that whatever's in the house is alive. A skeleton attacks Buffy and slices her back with a knife before turning back to plastic. Buffy puts together a plan. I'm going to make my way upstairs and see if there are any people up there. You guys find a way out of the house and use it. You're telling us to run away and leave you behind? We need help. We need the only person that can make sense of what's happening. Anya finds Giles and tells him what's happening and that he has to save Xander. Giles gathers his books and his chainsaw and they leave. At the frat house, fears start to manifest. Xander turns invisible. Willow's magic goes wrong, Oz starts to change into a werewolf, and Buffy, once again, is alone as she falls into the basement and is attacked by dead bodies coming up from the ground, while a dead frat boy taunts her. No matter how hard you fight, you just end up in the same place. I don't see why you bother. 
Giles cuts a hole in the house and he and Anya go inside. Buffy, Xander, Willow, and Oz all meet in the attic where the symbol was painted. They figure out what's going on. Something is feeding off their fears. Giles chainsaws through the wall and tells them about the fear demon, Gaknar. Buffy destroys the symbol on the floor, accidentally bringing Gaknar forth, which would have been really bad, except that he's about six inches tall. Which, you know, I hear is average for a fear demon. Tremble before me. Fear me! He... He's so cute! Tremble! Who's a little fear demon? Come on! Who's a little fear demon? Don't I taunt bring the terror. fear demon. Why can he hurt me? No, it's just tacky. Buffy steps on Gaknar and squishes him, and everyone goes to Giles' house for a post-slaying candy fest. Giles flips through his books and makes an interesting discovery. I should have translated the Gaelic inscription under the illustration of Gaknar. What's it say? Actual size. All right, Noel. So Fear Itself, another Halloween episode. Um, I'm curious, what did you think? I love a Halloween episode. I love mm-hmm. a haunted house, which is what this is. Um, yes. And I love, the, there are many wonderful interactions mm-hmm. in this episode that I love. Um, but before I get to the relationship um fun and games <laughs> in this episode, um, I realized that you asked me a question last week that I never actually answered. Uh-huh. And that question was, is Anya disrobing in front of Xander sexual assault? Mm-hmm. And I talked a little bit about the portrayal of sexuality in film and television and a lot sure. about heterosexism. But to answer the question, I think yes. I think mm-hmm. it is. Um Unexpected, unasked for nudity is assaultive. And I maintain that that juice box moment that will be featured heavily in the opening credits (laughs) is a fear response from Xander and not a pleasure response. Um, Okay. And we also misspoke last week. It's not Xander doesn't come to Anya. She approaches him and her Mm -hmm. behavior gets a pass from the show because at this point she exists only to want Xander. So if we gender flip the Xander on your relationship thus far, or if we queer Mm -hmm. it in any way, the problematic elements come through, I think, on multiple levels. And for my money, it doesn't get much better in this episode. I know you have some feelings about Xander and Anya in this episode. Um, But I mean... It's Anya's single-minded obsession with Xander that gets Woodcutter Giles out to the frat house. And as uh-huh. much as I love a good chainsaw ex machina, meh. Yeah, yeah I hear you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I do love Anya's enormous bunny costume for no other reason than what it does to her walk. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, of course, just to drive home the idea that Anya thinks only of herself when Xander tells her to get a scary costume, she gets something that frightens her. Sure. So mm-hmm. Anya, I mean, Anya embodies her fear with her costume, whereas mm-hmm. everyone else seems to be reacting to their fears with their costumes, which we'll get to when we talk about the costumes. Um, yes. But Anya not is not looking so good so far. No, you know, it's really not good. And it's funny because the conversation that we had about it last week uh, was really interesting. Like, I'm still kind of trying to figure out not only what I feel, but like what culturally, why culturally we look at a man disrobing, you know, unasked for as clearly assaultive, but a woman not, right? Because women are weaker, because Anya is a small person, because all of these different things, right, that make it quote unquote okay for a woman to do this, but not okay for a man to do this or for any like, yeah, if you gender flip or queerify it at all, it becomes very, very clear that this is a problem, right? Um, So last time we had that conversation. And it was a really good conversation. And I'm actually really glad about all the stuff that I got wrong in that because I think that it kind of when I get that stuff wrong, it kind of shines a light on the the ways in which we kind of automatically think that that have problems and that need some looking at, you know. So I don't mind being wrong. It's fine. I don't mind people coming and yelling at me in Discord. I love it. No, no. We got <laughs> we got some responses in Discord. And unfortunately, I was away last week, so I got to read them, but I didn't really have time to respond to them. Uh, there's some really great discussion happening in the Discord chat um, regarding uh, the ways in which we kind of view this particular kind of setup, you know. 
Um, and there were a lot of people who were um, who were providing some really great perspectives on that. So I definitely heartily recommend if you are a patron, uh, definitely go into the Discord chat and check that out. If you're not a patron, become a patron. Go to patreon.com slash chipperish and join in. It's well, well worth it. Um, but uh, but overall, like I think that you're absolutely right. It is sexual assault. Just because she's tiny, just because he's stronger than she is, just because we have this idea that men like when women do that doesn't mm-hmm. mean that it's not assaultive. Like it is unasked for. You don't have consent to take off your clothes in a sexual, you know, connotation with this person. Um, then you really, really need to not do that, right? But the idea that culturally um, we thought that was cute and funny says a lot more about us than it does about anything else, us yeah. and, and our culture. Um, so I think that you're absolutely right. I think that um, it is a problem, and the fact that it took us so much talking about it to really un cover and discover that it's a problem is also a problem. <laughs> right. Right. But yeah. that's, you know, and of course, that's why we talk about it, because there right. there are a couple of other things um, in this episode. And then I know coming up this season, there are some mm-hmm. some uh, plot and uh, story elements that are yeah. intensely problematic mm-hmm. now. But, right. you know, looking at them the first time, especially for somebody in a position where, you know, maybe this has never come up for you. Sure, <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's not, it's easy to, it's easy to go along with the cultural narrative because, of course, that's what yeah. we, you know, that's what we're, what we're fed. Well, that's how you learn. Your yeah. culture tells you, your culture and your stories tell you what's okay and what's not okay. That's, that's the grand origin of the cautionary tale, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, which we're going to talk about a little bit later when we revisit Little Red Riding Hood again in this story, the way that we did um, back in Helpless, right? Um, but I think that, yeah, because we have to, we have to kind of sort through this stuff. We have to take a look at it and kind of get past those presumptions because when we were very, very young, our culture told us this was okay by mm-hmm. writing these stories and making it uh, presented presenting it as cute right mm-hmm. um so i think that there's a lot of work that has to be done with that there are a lot of questions that we have to ask and this is what part of the real value is whether you're a you know professional story person or a critic or whatever there is a huge value in thinking critically about the stories that you're being told by your culture because those stories may embed within them some really really problematic ideas that then you will go on to believe are okay you know, right. and that's where we really need to kind of start talking and thinking, you know, critically about all of these things. So I think that's a really great place to start this episode while we continue talking about all of the other stuff that's going on. But I really want to get into your analysis of all of these costumes and how they relate to the fears. I think you have some really great ideas going on in there. OK, I love any time in fiction in visual media when a character wears a costume um, yes. because it's such I mean. Just creatively behind the scenes, it's such a great opportunity for the the production designer and the costume designers and the directors and the actors to create a a richer, more expansive right. version of this character. So Buffy, mm-hmm. of course, is Little Red Riding Hood, mm-hmm. which is a delightful return to childhood in a costume from her literal childhood. Right. I love this detail that this mm-hmm. is her costume from when she was yeah. 12 that Joyce then lets out for her mm-hmm. so that she can wear it again at what 18 19 18 mm-hmm. and the the story that goes along with that you know that she was you know she wore this when she was 12 which is mm-hmm. right on that right on that right. you know tween teen changeover She's mm-hmm. in this space where she has cop to not coping. She's having, she's right. experiencing post Parker depression. Um, <laughs> she is, she is dealing by not dealing. And one of the things that she does is go back to this kind of childhood space of mm-hmm. not engaging with the dating mating rituals of her yes. <laughs> her age group mm-hmm. you know she doesn't want to meet willow says you'll meet someone and she says i don't want to meet someone she right. wants to mm-hmm. be separate from the the adult responsibility piece and also the adult mm-hmm. sexuality piece of 
right. her experience right now. Um, and again, I just I love the detail that it is her childhood costume. It's not just a childish costume. Yes. It is from her childhood. And right. of course, we have the opportunity to speak to Joyce, which we don't get very often. Um, yeah. But we'll get there. So then Xander, of course, is James Bond. Or cool mm-hmm. head waiter guy, right. <laughs> you know, wearing a suit, which is the opposite of his current sense of himself, of being powerless, mm-hmm. right? living in a basement, you know, no real yeah. future. He certainly doesn't feel cool or capable. Right. And he has pointedly mm-hmm. chosen this costume so that, you know, should yeah. any Ethan Rain type chaos happen again, he will be turned sure. into something cool and powerful. And it's right. just very, like, it's very sweet. There's something very, mm-hmm. very sweet about that. Willow is probably my favorite of the costumes. Mm-hmm. Willow, yes. when we first see her, it looks like she's just a knight or someone mm-hmm. who serves a lord as a mounted soldier. So she's a sidekick, mm-hmm. it appears. right? Um, but she reveals that she's Joan of Arc. Of course, French heroine mm-hmm. charged with heresy, witchcraft, and violating divine law for dressing as a man. <laughs> um, yep. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all around badass. And something I love right. about this detail for Willow is that she is exploring her path, her, her mm-hmm. you know, her connection to witchcraft. And witches and saints are alike in that they don't require an intermediary between themselves and the divine. I really, mm-hmm. really like this detail for Willow. Yeah, that's cool. And of course, of course, speaking of the divine, Oz as God. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. I love him so much. Which, which, okay, first of all, such a wonderful in-character kind of move for Oz. Yes. To just mm-hmm. wear mm-hmm. his Ozzy best with a hello, my name is. Hello, my Sticker. name is God. God. But I love that because she goes because of her close relationship with God. And then he just opens up his jacket and there's this sticker. It's so cute. And that grin, her grin, like they're so mm-hmm. pleased. Yeah. But what I love about about this costume for Oz is that Oz's darkness takes him down a notch to animal. You know, when he changes into a werewolf. Yeah. So he elevates himself to mm-hmm. divine with his costume he takes yeah. himself up a notch um yes which is you know especially considering where his arc goes um mm-hmm. you know he he foreshadows it a little bit here talking about the darkness that is the wolf and what it feels like yeah. to really embrace that and his his own conflicted feelings about being a werewolf and having this darkness inside of him um Mm -hmm. and the costume like there's something really really poignant about all of these costumes at least for me i mean i find (laughs) i find it all surprisingly moving (laughs) and i think it's all supposed to just be funny I think so, but I love the the connections that you're making between where they are, you know, in their in their lives and their experiences and how they're choosing um they're choosing costumes that are that are highly aspirational. I think except for Buffy's which is about regressing, you know, yeah. going back to a time where things were simpler. Um but it's just it's wonderful. I love that whole analysis. I think it's great. <laughs> Yeah, so speaking of Buffy and her little red riding hood get up. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot going on here there's with that. Um as we talked about in Helpless, um we have a little red riding hood that is explicitly referenced with regard to Buffy's red coat, right, in that episode. But little red riding hood is about the dangers of men leading women into sex, aka the woods, right? Um in little red riding hood, the girl and her grandmother are both harmed by a man, the wolf, and then saved by a man, the woodcutter, right? So what's interesting about this is that it reflects a classic abuse tactic, feed the poison and give the cure over and over and over again, right? Mm -hmm. So this creates a sense of dependence in the victim. They remember only that the perpetrator made them feel better, saved them, and they forget that the perpetrator also caused the original harm in the first place. Now, granted, in the the, um, fairy tale, they are two different men, but they still represent manhood, 
You yes. know, each represents a side of the, the shadow and the light of manhood, the same way we have shadow and light Xander, which, of course, something we're going to be talking about a little bit more later as well. Um, so uh, we have that dynamic, the perpetrator hero dynamic played out with these two different characters. Right. Uh, but you could argue that the story culturally is specifically designed to encourage a codependent relationship between men and women. Right. Um, that women will be dependent upon men to save them and also afraid of men that will harm them. Right. But it's all that their entire emotional response is externalized to be about men and what men are going to do, which way men are going to choose. Are they going to choose perpetrator or hero? And then women just have to respond to that. And that's kind of like how a lot of these stories have been told throughout the ages, kind of reinforcing that idea that women need men to make those choices and cannot, you know, in essence, protect themselves. And then we have this whole thing with Joyce, right? You know, talking yeah. about Hank loved to take Buffy out for Halloween. And once again, it was about keeping her safe. You know, um, Buffy says he was such a pain, 12 years old, and I can't go trick or treating by myself. And then Joyce says he wanted to protect you, you know, yeah. um, which is that male right responsibility, that male role. And in the end, he abandoned her. You know, mm -hmm. so Buffy is processing all of this stuff with the men who have made choices that have negatively affected her. She talks about Angel. She, I'm Scott Hope, I think, is part of that. You know, uh, Parker Abrams, absolutely part of that, that, you know, you give your heart, you open your heart up and they bail, you know, and that that's what men do, um, which has been her experience, but not with Giles. Because Joyce says you have Mr. Giles, right? <laughs> yeah, I love the way she Giles calls him Mr. One. Giles. <laughs> I know. And that she says my last relationship was with a robot. I mean, of course, technically it was. She and she and Giles were under the influence. But uh, mm -hmm. it may have been her last relationship may have been with a robot. But her last sexual encounter was not. Although we're just going to whistle right past that because nobody wants to have that conversation in the Summers household right now. Um, but in the end, what I find really interesting also about this little Red Riding Hood thing, which again could be just like this this accidental reference, right? Except that it is the blood of a wolf that turns the predatory frat boy's plans deadly, that makes them real, makes this this demon manifest, right? Yep. Um, and in the end, it's the boys who die and get hurt. Like one of them is, you know, shaking in a panic attack in the closet. The other one has his neck broken as he falls down the stairs, right? Um, these boys end up, you know, actually paying a price for that kind of predatory behavior that we saw. So here they are exhibiting this predatory behavior it is the blood of a wolf that turns that predatory behavior real and it is the men who die you know from it yeah. which i thought was really kind of interesting yeah. um but then we have you know the literal blood of a wolf starts the spell and then giles comes in with his chainsaw a literal <laughs> woodcutter right and he is the one who saves the day yeah so i find all of that so interesting which makes me think that this was not an accident this is deliberately you know woven into this story which makes me like it a lot more i have honestly traditionally never been a huge fan of fear itself it's never been one of my favorite episodes although watching it now i'm like oh no i like this i've actually really enjoyed this episode i think more in this run through than i ever have and part of it is because i'm seeing these things that i think were put in there deliberately and that makes it kind of delightful to to have something, you know, to really read within this episode. Um, but the bottom line is like Little Red Riding Hood perpetuates the idea that the woman is a helpless victim to men's sexual desires. We're doing this while Buffy is processing what Parker has done to her and, you know, her post Parker depression, the way that Oz put it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and all the women uh, and all the women at this predatory frat party, you know, are there to be preyed upon. Right. Yeah. But it's the guys who die. And I kind of I kind of like that. I kind of think that there was one girl who was like kind of dead on the couch and there was blood coming out of her mouth. But then she looked up and smiled at the camera in this very weird kind of like, you know, um, kind of altered reality sort of way. Um, that was a little bit weird. So there's a lot yeah. of stuff in there that that is a little weird. Yeah. With the strobe light going as all of the yeah. magic is taking place upstairs. Mm -hmm. I had I had some questions about what again you know whenever there's an altered reality like okay but what right. actually happened like is that right what you did know, actually happen you mentioned you mentioned that that one uh frat brother dies and i'm pretty sure that yeah he does he right. he falls victim to his own trap mm -hmm. in a sense but it's interesting to me that like we're not we're not going to address that 
And it appears that a lot of right. the danger, it appears that a lot of the danger of the haunted house, as it were, yeah. um, is temporary. So is it just that he yes. was unlucky and running in his fear? He trips and ends up dying in his and own so that was real. haunted house. And that's right. real? Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. And yeah, there's that moment with that one girl who appears to be dead and then opens her eyes and sort of grins at the camera yeah. in this way right. that feels very not Buffy to me. Like, it, it <laughs> we're does. suddenly it's a in really a different weird, It's a weird thing. moment. We're mm-hmm. in a different thing, in a different, you know, doing a different kind of scary right horror. and also playing again with that reality with that line of reality you know because everything that they're experiencing is whatever their fears are but then buffy gets sliced by the plastic skeleton and she is bleeding from her back like the whole night like mm-hmm. that appears to also be real like her injury is real mm-hmm. you know and at that moment after she gets sliced right you know okay this is this is a bit much, but let's just go as long as I'm going here with like this, you know, this little red riding hood, She's you know, gonna go there. predatory sexuality <laughs> thing. As she gets penetrated and sliced and hurt and bleeding by a phallic object wielded by a masculine present. I mean, skeletons are really gender neutral, I think. But, you know, but it does feel like a masculine presenting, you know, skeleton. Um, so, I mean, that's a little sad. But at that point, that is when when she gets hurt by that, she takes off the the um coat she takes mm-hmm. off the the little red riding hood coat she stays in the rest of the costume but she takes that like that shield off and then like finds her own power as she's going through you know this space yeah and so it's, it's the cape that saves her too there's a it is brief the cape line her. about the the right the cape took most of it with the right stabbing right. so but she's still bleeding. Yeah. But that cape is, you know, it's the it's the cape of the patriarchy that she has to. I don't know what it is. I don't know. That's bullshit. But I mean, like, if you want to read it that way, you I can read it. it that way. You know, it's the patriarchy's cape and she takes it off. Well, mm-hmm. I love it. And I also love that that is the moment when Xander disappears. Yes. It's not acknowledged until much later. But it's, again, one of those things that if you watch it back. Right. He's you been, can see. He has disappeared from the group. Mm-hmm. Right around the time that she's stabbed. Now, right. I'm not going to do that, you know, psychoanalytic reading of <laughs> this episode. <laughs> That's a different podcast. But yeah. <laughs> it is it is interesting that they were clear, like all of all of Xander's dialogue and everything that comes after. Mm-hmm. That all yeah. lines up with the idea that Xander has already disappeared from the group. Well, yeah, because there's this moment where he says there's a hissing sound. And then Buffy's like, do you hear that? And he's I like, yeah, that. I just mentioned it. And she goes, it's like a sss. And he goes, I thought I, th- I, you know, I implied that with the hissing, right? You know, yep. so at this moment, it feels like this ordinary kind of dialogue between them, you know, because Xander often does get ignored, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it, it as we move through, we see that he is invisible, like they cannot see him. You know, um, that his fears of being unnecessary, of being, you know, um, invisible to all of his friends are actually starting to manifest as well. So it's it's pretty cool. I mean, I think um, what they do with Little Red Riding Hood and all of those analogs, I think, is is really, really interesting in this episode and so much fun. It's fun to see. I mean, the fact that it's a wolf that opens up this space and a woodcutter. (laughs) <laughs> that brings in the like that to me feels too on the nose it's to really be accidental. On the nose. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's really on the nose. It's, it's, it's kind of cool. really, really on the nose. And it's great. <laughs> it is. It's a lot of fun. So what else did you see in this episode? So I talked at the at the beginning of the show about relationships and there's some there's mm-hmm. some uh not so good stuff here, but there's some really right. good stuff in the Buffy Willow friendship relationship. I love Mm -hmm. the way this continues to build and grow, um, Mm -hmm. starting with when Buffy is leaving Xander's because she's tired. Willow immediately offers to go with her. Mm -hmm. Immediately, just like is ready to leave with Buffy and, you know, go back to the room. And it's just, it's so sweet. Like she's clearly, yeah. she's clearly on Buffy watch. <laughs> right. Just, yes. It's just great. Um, 
you know, and and Willow following Buffy out of the cafeteria when she spots Parker and is upset. Mm-hmm. And, you know, of course, Buffy says she's happily vacationing in the land of not coping. Right. Which, you know, good, good tactic, Buffy. Like sometimes the right. best solution really is to just feel bad until you don't feel bad anymore. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. But we've got this great bit of tension with Willow, who is happy and coming into her own and learning about her powers as a witch and enjoying a safe and loving relationship and excited mm-hmm. about college. And yes. here's Buffy, who is just not, you know, and Willow's trying, mm-hmm. like, you're going to have fun at the party and maybe you'll meet someone and you can see her really wanting Buffy to connect um, yeah. with college as a, you know, as a stage of life, but also with yes. her. You can see mm-hmm. that, like, you know, like, please be supportive of me, which is basically where she is at the beginning of their conversation yeah. in the cafeteria. Um, and it's this wonderful, like, it's a wonderful friendship dynamic that I mm-hmm. have I have been on both sides of. <laughs> <Where> <laughs> like, <laughs> things are great, you know, like, please come celebrate with me. Or, you know, things are shitty and I need to just back away and I need you to stop encouraging me to Mm -hmm. go out and right you know try to pretend like everything is okay um Mm -hmm. and I just love the moment when Xander calls Buffy a fifth wheel and Willow (laughs) elbows him out of the way and just takes Buffy's arm and is like move over dude this is how you best friend (laughs) she's like I know we're gonna have fun she's like made it her mission to love and protect this person who is in pain and I'm I'm here for it. I love it. I know it's wonderful, but I also love her pursuing her magic, talking about that, being very excited about that. We also have this what is college for if not experimenting, which of course foreshadows uh, you know, Willow's sexual transformation that is going to happen in, you know, a few episodes time. We're gonna see that start to happen. Um, because typically when we talk about college experimentation, we are talking about dabbling in various, you know, spaces a- along the sexuality spectrum that college is when you kind of figure that stuff out for yourself, you know? Um, So I thought that that was kind of interesting to like throw that in there as kind of a foreshadowing for things that Willow's going to go through later in the, in the season. Um, I also really like the way that she, she does best friend for Buffy, you know, and the way that that contrasts with her fears when she's actually in the house, you know, we have mm-hmm. all this support, you know, if Parker shows up, we'll just ax murder him. That's Halloween. Um, I really <laughs> like that. I like in the beginning when I think it was Xander who said, does anybody just want to shoot that guy? And everybody like raises their hand or whatever, or hit him in the face, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we see that like when we get into the fear house, right, that her response is, I am not your sidekick. I have my own power, you know? Yeah. And when Buffy says, you know, your, your spells work like, or 50% maybe at best, right? That is not Buffy talking. That is yeah. Willow talking. That yeah. is Willow's insecurities about her ability to handle that magic. Um, and so I find that really interesting. I love earlier when they're in the cafeteria and Oz comes in, you know, and is yep. is concerned for her and is showing that concern about her touching a power that she can't control. Um, so all of this stuff with um, with Willow, I think, is it's such a lovely insight into what's going on with her that we externalize the concern and the worry. But she obviously has that internalized because when we are realizing her worst fears in the fear house, that's what comes up. You know, that her her magic isn't good enough, that she can't do this, that she doesn't have the power that she wants to have, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when she creates the spell, the spell goes wonky. Now, a big part of that is because they're in the fear house. But as we're going to see multiple times throughout this season, uh, magic does tend to have uh, have unexpected consequences a lot of the time. Oh, yes. Um, It's very hard to keep magic under control. In a similar way, it's very hard to keep emotions under control. And I think that magic at this point in the story. Story. We're going to get to where magic is drugs later on, and that's stupid, but magic is emotions. Magic is hard to control the way that your own thoughts and emotions are hard to control. The kind of discipline that it requires for magic to work in a moment um, is a real, you know, um, acquired power that Willow does manage to get at a certain point. But when her emotions are a mess, she cannot do magic. You know, mm-hmm. that's when it becomes a real problem. 
So, yeah. um, so I find that really kind of interesting. And that's, that's the magic, not as much of a metaphor. It's not as much like an analog for something the way that magic equals drugs, you know, um, is an analog, but magic as a power that requires a tremendous amount of emotional and, um, you know, mental and psychological discipline, you know, um, I think that that's really interesting. And I love the fact that magic has consequence. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think that that's really important because any any power that comes without consequence isn't narratively interesting. You know, yeah. it's just it's just unearned power. It's just whatever. But power that comes through study and through discipline and through and has consequence, you know, um, mm -hmm. I think that kind of power is really, really interesting. So I like the stuff that they're doing with Willow in this episode. And this is when we start to see not just that she is trying to become powerful because we saw you know we saw giles turn to her earlier you know um when she, when he needed to to do a spell like he turned to willow to help with that spell you know mm -hmm. um and put her in charge of figuring out all the the different pieces and stuff so we're seeing like her being accepted more as a magical power but now she's having those um the, that bit of insecurity with that power which i think is really really cool and i like seeing that developed it's as part of willow's character because she is so confident the season Season. But to see like deep down inside what's happening with that confidence, I think is really interesting. Yeah. And they foreshadow that drug connection actually right, mm -hmm. right at the beginning yeah. of the episode. You know, she says, mm -hmm. I'll know when I've reached my limit. And Oz says, wine coolers. <laughs> and Bobby right. says, magic. <laughs> and, it, you know, so it's and it's just a, sh a tiny little, mm -hmm. a tiny little reference. But there's that connection. Um, right. And yeah, I hate it. I hate when they do that because I'm with you. Magic is not about a, it's not about taking a drug. Um, yeah. I mean, backing up, we've seen a little bit the drug like effects of engaging with magic. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And heard about them mostly from Giles and Ethan right. Rain and their group. But. But they I, were also like doing drugs. I think that's the implication, weren't yeah. they? Yeah, yes. I think there was I think, an implication I mean, that they were. Yeah, I think we're certainly supposed to read it that way. But mm -hmm. but much more than that, I think the 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 show wants us to see magic as this study in mm -hmm. darkness, um, yeah. which is why, of course, why Oz is concerned, why Giles is concerned. Mm -hmm. You know, that in order to, you know, with great power comes yes. great responsibility because with yes. great power comes access to the light and the dark. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. that's what we're seeing with Willow, you know, right like right from the beginning. I mean, even mm -hmm. floating a pencil in. Yeah doppelgangland when she she loses control of her calm and yeah. impales the tree mm -hmm. i mean that's a tremendous amount of force yeah so yeah <laughs> like mm -hmm. yeah yeah dark willow like it, yeah. she's in there she's in there already it's she's really interesting. in there already and it's that access to power. I mean, because the thing is that, like, if you a lot of times people behave themselves because they just don't have the option. When people have power, that's when you see who they truly are, because it's a choice made without restriction. You know, if right. you are if your power is so great that it is not res that you are not restricted the way that most everybody is all the time, um, then that's when, you know, you have that choice. It's like what you see what happens when people get a lot of money. You know, if they mm -hmm. start acting like assholes, they were always assholes. They just didn't have the option before. But now right. that they got money, they feel like they can be jerks to people, you know. Um, so there's that kind of thing because money, of course, is power, you know. Um, but the magic, the power in magic feels like it's it's more about power. And, of course, as we get to season seven, right, we open up season seven with it's about power. Yeah, It's always about power. What does power do to us? You know, if you have the power to change the world to your liking, which is what Tara accuses Willow of at the beginning beginning of season six right mm -hmm. um then that's something that you need to you know you have to moderate yourself because the lack of power isn't moderating you you have the power so um so it's really interesting seeing willow go along those lines and that's why the the magic as drugs things kind, kind of annoys me but the magic the power as a drug doesn't annoy me so much um right. but it's just a slight shift in the perspective on that run 
um, yeah. that it requires. And also like, you know, the way that she's, she's going to that guy, you know, with Amy, uh, the, the dealer or whatever, like yeah. and that and treating magic, they're calling it magic, but it really is just a drug trip. And that's, different you know yeah um but the power that magic gives you being being a bit heady i think is actually a really interesting theme and we do address that in a lot of ways throughout the run of the show which is Mm -hmm. really really fun yeah i like that um but one of the things i don't like and boy am i going to be glad when this passes is the post parker depression like it's (laughs) another exceptional woman being like hurt by an unworthy man and i'm so tired of seeing this both in real life and (laughs) on the show right um oh it's goodness. just it's just too much after a while it just gets really annoying but she's so depressed she can't even go to class then she goes in and she you know talks to professor walsh and professor walsh is such a dick about it i mean she just <laughs> is such a dick it's like i count four limbs in a head and you know fuck off you don't need to like fuck with her just remind her of your attendance policy that is in the syllabus and then she can figure out what the consequence is going to be for missing the class you know See, I love um, it. you don't she's need to be so a jerk mean and it. i love it <laughs> I know I know you kind of dig her. How's your Maggie Walsh crush going? Uh it's it's going great. Actually, I love her in this episode. <laughs> she has that one tiny <laughs> little you know, <laughs> like yes. and I think I've been thinking about this and I think a lot of it has to do with not seeing mm-hmm. that archetype from yeah. a woman. Like she's mm-hmm. oh, she's completely an asshole, but Women aren't <laughs> often allowed to be assholes like that. True, true. And I, yes. I enjoy seeing that. I also enjoy, I enjoy her sense of her own importance. Like she knows, right? She knows what she's up to. She knows what she's capable of, and she does not have time for these students. Like now, <laughs> it raises the question: Why is she teaching these students? You know, why is she doing this and not just like? you know twirling her mustache Although and petting we, her cat in her underground why. lair all the time but right but her her role there as a professor is the cover story for the lair and the and the sure. research so like so like we know why she's there but you know for right. me like i totally get the um how nice it is to see a woman not trying to be all nice and accommodating and whatever because we are as women culturally encouraged to be sweet right you know um all the time to be sweet and nurturing and blah 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 and she doesn't have time for that bullshit and i actually do like that but i think for me just you know working in a college i teach classes i teach students um my job there is to teach them in the way that is most productive and some and so like i shutting them down and being a dick you know it's one thing to say these are my boundaries these are my rules check your syllabus you know i've done that before because sometimes you do need to put down a little bit you got to put your foot down you got to maintain your boundaries because otherwise you know some students may not get as much out of the class as they should be getting you know as what they're paying for because they're paying a lot for it they're going to learn in my class they may not like me i don't care if they like me i care that they learn you know um but so college professors that are dicks just for ego's sake which is what she was doing right there Mm -hmm. that and annoys me because I don't think that that is about the student. That's about the ego of the teacher. And I don't have time for that. Um, So, yes, I think we're seeing this from two different perspectives. I think here's the thing. I think we're seeing the same thing and I think we are responding to it differently. And that is the beauty of it's always fun reflecting upon these things with someone else. It is. It's always really fun. Yeah. 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 But then and then, of course, Riley backs (sighs) up Professor Walsh, which is (laughs) interesting to me yes i'm i again i like i like his relationship with her i like the way he thinks the world of her and you know he says to buffy you know professor walsh is worth your time yeah Mm -hmm. and you know of course of course we know what's going on but but at this point in the season we don't know what's going on exactly all we see is this ta yeah this like Mm -hmm. very sweet very pretty TA who's like not going out on Halloween because he's grading papers with his oh my god giant muscles. I'm sorry. Oh what? my We're... god! Right, exactly. <laughs> like, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> wow, between Maggie Walsh and Mark Lucas, you're just losing your mind in this scene, aren't you? <laughs> it's hard for me. Okay, I'm like, I'm I keeping understand. it. I am. I I'm understand. keeping it under control. I'm trying to like see what the story is telling us and right. not what my 
rich inner life is telling me. But right. <laughs> yes. But yes, I mean, Riley, <laughs> Riley has this reputation for being kind of the worst. And yes, at this it's point, though, in the beginning of season four, though, he's pretty good. He's yeah. Great. Like, I hate him. I hate him with my whole heart because of essentially like season five, Riley. There's some annoying Riley later in this season, but mostly it's season five, Riley, that I just absolutely hate and have no patience for, you know? Um, And that kind of poisons my perception of Riley at this point. But at this point, he's pretty sweet. He's pretty cool. I like him, you know? I like that he's not instantly in love with Buffy because she's beautiful. Like when he falls in love with her, he falls in love with her because of who she is, not because she's beautiful beautiful and I think that that's a really nice not just um you know a nice thing for him a nice character beat for him but also a nice reflection on Buffy that her being beautiful is not the most important thing about her and I really do like that we have that you know um in this season um but you know I mean there's all this stuff like everything about him I I was annoyed about and it really wasn't fair like I was like you know there's this line where he's like yes I dimly recall freshman year I'm like shut up you're like 23 I'm 48 and I very very <laughs> clearly recall my freshman year I remember what that was like it was so much fun I had a great time so <laughs> Shut up, Riley. Like, it's always then, you know, he's like, well, Halloween is the day that ghosts and goblins come out and all this. I'm like, oh, shut up. And then she's like, well, that's a misnomer. And I'm like, no, it's not really a misnomer so much as a misconception. But that's me being pedantic. So I'm going to shut up about that. (laughs) I love that exchange, though, because when Riley says I didn't mean real ones. It's the tiniest yes. bit of foreshadowing. Like, well, it is especially because he knows there are real ones. He knows there are real, real beasties mm-hmm. out there. Yeah. yeah. I I love this interaction between them because it is mm-hmm. goofy. He's doing that. He's doing that like, oh, shucks, goofy, nice guy thing. Yes. But then mm-hmm. when she thanks him and it's genuine, he says, you're welcome. And it's genuine. And you can see yeah. that little bit of like, huh, like you can see a touch of the Oz, who is that girl, n- you know, cross his face. Or maybe that's yes. just me. I like, yes. I really like the beginning of the Buffy Riley relationship. Like I really, it has potential, but of course no one can be happy. So <laughs> not really. Right. Exactly. 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 Um, yeah. I, I'm just very poisoned by season five Riley. And that's I, I hate him so much that he reaches back in, that he <laughs> reaches back in time and takes season four Riley by the throat and throttles him every time I see him. Which so is, uh, so yes. for me, it's very hard to separate that. Well, yeah. then I it's, will, it's I will right. love right. early season four Riley enough for both of us. Please do. Please do. Because I think that he deserves the love. I really do. Yeah. I think that he's, he's, I like him. I like him in the beginning, you know, on it, but he just, but I'm so annoyed by everything that he becomes that, um, that at this point I find it really, really difficult to separate that out in the same way that like, even when Xander's being terrible in the early parts of the show, I have find it impossible to separate out from the Xander that I love from later seasons. Yeah. So I, I am willing to give him a pass on stuff that I should not be giving him a pass on. And it's kind of the reverse with Riley. Yeah. Like I'm not giving, I'm not giving him a goddamn inch because I hate <laughs> that asshole. You know, he really, really annoys me. Um, <laughs> But we have, you know, Buffy talking about there being like a pattern in the way that men treat her. You yeah. know, we've got Angel Scott Hope Parker, open your heart to someone they bail on you. Maybe it's easier just not to let them in. Um, and it's interesting because Joyce says at that point that there's nothing to be afraid of. Right. Yeah. yeah, but that's not true. Like Buffy could open her heart again and be hurt again. And she will because it's a Joss Whedon show. Um, but she just has to decide if that risk is worth it. You know, a chance she's willing to take. So here we have Joyce again being sort of the the mom vending machine, you know, with like mm-hmm. this this platitude of something that looks like wisdom. It's kind of like those uh, those like health food bars that like pretend to be candy bars, but they're not candy bars like that. You know, they're not <laughs> right. Um, you know, and that's kind of like what Joyce is right now. It's like it's 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 purporting to be wisdom but it's really not (laughs) because the wisdom is you're gonna get hurt you have to learn how to deal with that you cannot protect yourself from it there is stuff to be afraid of when you open your heart to other people there just is you know and and acknowledging that as a reality and figuring out how to deal with it as you grow into adulthood that's what Buffy needs from her mom right now yeah telling someone there's nothing to be afraid of is not usually helpful Even if that is the objective truth, even when that is the objective truth, if somebody is uncomfortable or afraid saying 
there's nothing to be yeah. afraid of. Not Does helpful. not help. Does not help them process that fear. The the fear, you know, comes from the sense of our, our lack of power and our lack of agency in the situation, you know. Um, and I think that, like, you know, developing her daughter's sense of agency of whatever happens, you'll deal with it. You'll be OK because look what you've mm-hmm. been through and what you've come through, you know, that something terrible may happen. Terrible things are always uh, terrible things are going to happen eventually someday. You know, it all, they always do. Mm-hmm. But um, but I mean, knowing that you will be equipped to deal with it when it does um, can can have a calming effect. So I think that would make Joyce, you know, a more effective parent in this particular situation. <laughs> But right now, we're going to spend a little time talking about patrons. This episode of Still Pretty is brought to you by our generous patrons who keep Chipperish Media going so we can produce all the podcasts you love, like Still Dead about Angel the Series, Listen Up A-Holes about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Orgasm about Explosive Inspiration, our Star Wars podcast, Metaphors Be With You, and How Story Works, a free college-level course in narrative theory. If you enjoy what we do here at Chipperish, please consider going to patreon.com slash chipperish and throwing in your support. Even a few dollars a month makes a huge difference and thank you so much to all of our patrons who make everything we do here possible hey i thought clive was doing the patreon asks where is he oh right yeah you know that thing where you sleep with a guy and then he goes all evil Uh uh-oh yeah that absolutely did not happen to me again you're okay oh yeah no it was fun while it lasted but i'm done getting my validation from men unlike anya who Oh, my God. We were talking about the problems with Anya dealing with Xander, oh, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. And the thing that's really interesting is that I actually really love Xander in this episode. This Xander is the Xander that I remember when I think about Xander. Um, and I like the way that he deals with Anya. I like all of his stuff. Anya, on the other hand, who I ordinarily really love and adore, um, is kind of a problem in this episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not it, it's not it's not a good look, Anya. I don't it's not I good. do not care for it. I don't like they it. They paint at her all. as the crazy girlfriend trope, right? She's like, it's been exactly one week since we copulated. Her smile disappears and she goes, Did you forget? And I'm like, Jesus Christ, just give her a butcher knife and, and you know, go like end it there. Because <laughs> you're clearly setting up that she is this you know, crazy obsessive, which is not really who she is. I'll, what we're paying her between last, you know, time with the sexual assault and now with this kind of like crazy pinwheels in the eyes stuff going on. <laughs> um, it's not a great kind of, you know, position for Anya as a character that we're going to, you know, grow to care about in a lot of ways. Um, And it doesn't seem consistent either with the Anya that we saw from like earlier, like in The Wish and in Doppelgangland, which is the Anya that I love, the Mm -hmm. capable, smart, knows what's going on Anya. Mm -hmm. Now we're in this middle space with this weird transitional Anya that we can't quite figure out where she fits, you know? Um, She's completely obsessed. When she goes to see Giles, and she's like, you have to save Xander. Xander's in trouble. You must save Xander. Yeah, the rest of them are there too. But Xander, you know, like her obsession is really, it's not good. It feels like, it feels like a twist on a masculine fantasy of the woman who sleeps with him and then is completely, you know, fawning over him. Mm-hmm. Except right. that we're making fun of Anya for being so like I'm so confused as to what we're even trying to do with these characters like am I supposed to feel bad for Xander that Anya is so obsessed with him am I supposed to feel sad for Anya that she's created a relationship where there's not really a relationship like what I don't know how to feel and I'm just uncomfortable that's where I I am with Anya and Xander Absolutely. I think it's supposed to be funny. I think what we're doing is going for the joke, but creating greater consequences with that joke. I think that's what happened last time with the sexual assault, with the getting naked without consent. Um, and I think that's what's happening now, um, that we're we're just using her. And again, because Emma Caulfield has such impeccable comic timing, she becomes the comedy mule a lot. Although we do get, a, a, I think, a better grasp on her character and who she is as we move forward with her. She does go through a huge transition 
from the kick-ass Anya that we saw in The Wish and Doppelgangland into this Anya who's a little a little more, you know, she's the truth teller. She's the one who sees. She's the one who reads everything literally, you know, and she's completely obsessed, obsessed with Xander because she wants that experience, which she has been, you know, creating vengeance on men but from watching other women go through this and now she wants to have that experience. I think actually that's a really interesting place to go if we were doing some kind of evaluation on Anya and what it is that inspires her to want this relationship with Xander despite the fact that she knows what happens in relationships between people. You know, that she has been getting vengeance all these years for the terrible things that men have done to women. Of course, it's a very heteronormative view of where vengeance is required. Any any romantic relationship can have anybody be terrible and anybody be obsessive. And there are women who are terrible to men that men might want vengeance, but she had a very particular niche. It was women wanting vengeance on mm-hmm. men, right? For these romantic relationships. Um, so after having spent a millennia, right? You know, a millennium um, watching women suffer because of loving men, the first thing when she's human that she wants to do more than anything is engage in exactly that thing. So I actually find that a really interesting character beat, you know, that she wants to understand this thing that she has been on the sidelines of this whole time, right? I kind of love that, but we don't do anything with it. We just play it. We just play this as a joke instead of like picking up that very neat kind of psychological reflection and doing something interesting with it. Yeah. Um. So it's it's a real waste. There's a much but, better story there than what we oh, get. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's some really great stuff that could happen there. I could really love her desire to have this relationship if we'd put it in that context. I want to understand what it is that happens, you know. Um, so I think that that would be really neat. But we don't do that. We're not doing anything with that. Although it's it's a huge lost opportunity. Um, but Xander in this episode, I don't know how you feel about like, I kind of love Xander in this episode all the way through. I love his sweet, self-deprecating, you know, um, like the way that he was talking in the beginning and in the, in the open when they were doing the Halloween stuff. You know, he was uh, he has this insecurity about, you know, not being invited to the parties and not knowing what's going on and not being in college. Um, and that's a, that's a real lovely space for vulnerability for him. Um, I love him with Anya. You know, he goes, the funny thing about me, I tend to hear words people say and accept them at face value. And she goes, <laughs> that's stupid and he goes I accept that um that's adorable like I love this Xander I love when he says Anya you ex-demon terrorize men for centuries I'm sure you'll come up with something you know um he's so sweet you know when he's in with the frat guys and they're talking about doing all these things to get the women to fall into their arms you know and he says and here I was buying them flowers and complimenting them on their shoes you know um I love him I love him in that tux uh, Xander looks good in that tux. <laughs> um, I love the whole thing you were talking about with his, like, you know, he wanted to be cool secret agent guy, you know, so that he can have the kind of power, um, you know, and she, and then Buffy says, you'll probably end up as cool head waiter guy. And he says, as long as I'm cool and wield some kind of power. So the, the lack of power in his life, how he feels that lack of power, I think is really interesting. I love that you pointed that out with his costume earlier. Um, so, I mean, and then when we have him in his fear, right, you know, um, yeah. where he's like, I'm invisible, nobody can see me. And then he has this run where they're all kind of back into the attic and the fear has has stopped, but he thinks he's still invisible. And he says, I'd offer my opinion, but you jerks won't care. Not that didn't go to college, boy, has anything important to say. I might as well hang out with my new best friend, bleeding dummy head for all you dorks care. <laughs> like, I love that whole run. I love the way that he he's his insecurity about not going to college is beginning to show about the life that he has when Anya says you know you have nothing in common with these people there in college you're not there they left home you're living in the basement you know all this stuff like speaks so specifically to the things that Xander is insecure about and I love him in this episode what did you think I love him in the opener for sure yes um Mm -hmm. I love I love him trying to make a scary pumpkin and it comes out what is it right sardonic sardonic or something like it's <laughs> yeah it's very cute i really really enjoy mm-hmm. that and then of course the whole phantasm fantasia mix up right is yes delightful it's adorable is delightful He's i also so like cute. that this is 
the first of at least a couple of references to Phantasm. Because, of course, right. in Hush, we'll get the gentleman who mm-hmm. are a riff on the tall man from mm-hmm. Phantasm. Um, sometimes you see sometimes you see the the taste of the show creators <laughs> coming yes. through, oh, Xander. absolutely. Um, yes. You know, for, for better, for ill. I do. I like, I like Xander in the opener. Um, mm-hmm. I think, you know, a lot like... A lot like we were just talking about with Anya's story and how there's more story there. There's there's yeah. more and better story. I think right. the story about Xander feeling invisible and worrying about disappearing, especially now that his friend group is in college and he isn't. Yeah. That is a mm-hmm. much more compelling story that we could explore. But mm-hmm. instead, we do this relationship with Anya. And right. I, I don't know. I don't know. But... It is it is interesting to me that when we're when we have the frat guys being mm-hmm. just the worst because nothing good ever happens in a frat house. Nothing right. good. Yeah. Certainly not on this show. Um no. you know, they're just being slimy and Xander's like uh no. <laughs> no. Right. No, no. Um I I appreciate it. I do. Yeah. Um mm-hmm. but I don't know, I guess I get hung up on the on the Xander Anya thing here, even mm-hmm. though it's it's very one sided, it's very Anya at this point. Yeah. Um because of just like this is how not to do a relationship. <laughs> it's a lot Oh yeah. Of, no, it's absolutely how not to do it. It's a lot of there's a lot of this is how not to do a relationship on this show. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then of course, you know, we have we also have Oz being relationship guy oh my in God. in a different way. <laughs> yes. I love him in this episode. I love the um you know, like we talked about in the cafeteria when he's worried about her, when he's worried about her magic, like all of that is so sweet. You know, supportive boyfriend is picking up your dry clean, but he wants me to tell you he's worried about you. <laughs> okay. So good. I love all of that. But my favorite thing is, he, you know, in the end, he says, but just know that whatever you decide, I'll back your play. Right? Yeah. I freaking love that. Yeah. I love that he's not trying to control what she does. I love that he's not imposing his concern for her as a directive on what she has to do and has to choose. Mm-hmm. You know, he's just letting her know that he's worried. Um, I love in the beginning when uh, Xander has the, the mistake with Fantasia and he goes, maybe it's because of all the horrific things we've seen, but hippos wearing tutus just don't unnerve me the way they used to. <laughs> it's just such classic, classic Oz. Um, but I love too that it's Oz's blood that completes the magic, you know, that yep. creates this situation. I and mean, part of the reason why I love that is because because of the Little Red Riding Hood, you know, analog, because it is the blood of a wolf that starts this whole shit up. Um, I think that it's great. So I really, really love Oz in this episode. This is my first, this episode I think is my first moment of not really buying Oz though. And uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I mean, when he's, he is, by which I mean, <laughs> his speech to Willow about the darkness involved in being a werewolf and where, I don't know, We I feel like we need a little bit more depth to that performance. There needs to be just a little bit more mm-hmm. weight to it. And yeah. I'm not sure that Seth Green is up to it. And it bums me out. Because okay. mm-hmm. there's, yeah, mm-hmm. there's again, there's more story there, um, and we just don't get it because I yeah. think I think maybe the performance isn't there. I think it's a hard performance to do oh, yeah. in that moment. I think that if they'd given, and again, like if they uh, if they'd actually given that story some space, but they give him one line to give that story, and you know, part of that is I love Seth Green, so I'm always going to defend Seth Green. I think you might be right though. Because yeah. I kind of had that feeling too in that moment. But I also think it's a very difficult line to put in at that point, you know, in the in the scene. It felt a little weird. It felt a little heavy handed. Yeah. Um, and so, it yeah, does feel like know. they need to get it in there because they're going to, you know, yes. we're going to have mm-hmm. Oz exit the show in X number of episodes. We need to like episodes. get this train mm-hmm. a moving. Um, 
And yeah. yeah, it doesn't it doesn't quite work for me, but Oz in the bathtub when when he's changing and he's going, not gonna change, not gonna change, his his mantra is just oh man, that I mm-hmm. I have feelings about that. I have a lot of feelings about that. Yeah. Because that fear, even with the the werewolf, you know, mask right. on, the werewolf mm-hmm. um prosthetics, he I hear the fear and I see the fear yeah. and part of it is his body posture and part of it is the yeah. camera is this like beautiful steady cam, you know, swoops right. into the bathroom and like finds mm-hmm. him there all isolated and talking to himself. But mm-hmm. I hear like I hear the the fear in that. Yeah. Um, and I think that that gets across so much more than the line that they gave us. The textual line of like, when you touch that darkness, it's not a great line. That's Angel. Right? That's um, Angel. Yeah. We had some leftover Angel lines that we, we just some leftover threw Angel in. in the fridge. They were going to get moldy. So we <laughs> threw them in there with us. Yeah. Um, but this, where you see his, his intense fear of being a werewolf, of not having control over that power, of possibly hurting somebody when he changes... Um, mm-hmm. Like, I really love that. And I thought that that was that was really great um, bringing us into his experience of that darkness, you know. Um, so, yeah, I like that a lot. And I just I love Oz in general. But, yeah, we've got we've got a couple more episodes before we end up just rushing through this whole Oz thing. Yeah. Um, and that is going to is going to need to to get on the road soon. So I thought it was really nice. I could have done without the line in the cafeteria. I think we just had this. It would have been enough and more powerful speaking mm-hmm. to his fears um but i really like that um okay so giles can we talk about giles a little bit i think we have to have like a section that's just me talking about how much i love giles all the time <laughs> we, we could we could have a giles appreciation section of we might the need podcast. to do that we um, might need to do that because yeah this is this is big with me i love costume giles i love him being so excited about halloween the little frankenstein doll and how delighted he is and now he's experiencing you know he was like when i was your watcher i didn't you know i was focused on the job but now i'm not and i'm trying to find the things in my life that i want to do i love that for him i love chainsaw giles which may be like one of my favorite giles ever <laughs> like i watched that I watched him pick up that chainsaw and I was like, I'm going to need a moment, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I love everything. I love when Anya comes to him, you know, and he instantly takes her seriously and looks up everything in the books and figures it out and knows to bring a chainsaw to a house with a disappearing front door. Like he is prepared. He is Boy Scout Giles. I love him. I love him. <laughs> Do not taunt the fear demon. I love him. I really, really love Giles loving Halloween, but I cannot mm-hmm. get past that costume. <laughs> the costume's pretty bad. It's, I mean, it's pretty racist is what it is. Like, yeah. don't, uh-uh. Yeah. No, I mean, like a true colonizer, I guess, you know, you come yeah. to Southern California and just adopt somebody's culture as your costume. Mm-hmm. Not cute, not funny. If they wanted Giles to have a funny hat, which... I approve of he needs right. to have something well, ridiculous on his head when he opens the door. We get a very door. similar thing when he when he has opening day for the magic box in season five. Like we get that perfect little like, you know, sorcerer's apprentice hat on him and it's kind of adorable. Yeah. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I mean, no, man. No. Like Giles. I mean, this is yeah. and this is the season for me where I. Uh, I feel like I have to I have to like decolonize my desire a little bit. And right. Yeah. We'll get there. Uh we'll get mm-hmm. there with in, in a couple of weeks, actually. A couple of weeks, yes. Couple We're gonna weeks, get there we'll get big there. time. But yes. This was my first like, oh, oh no, no. I know. No. I know. But his And I'm torn because I love his goofiness. I love his goofiness and I love his enthusiasm. But yeah, that costume is is bad news. It's not good. I like that he goes to the house, to the frat house as himself, though, or as Chainsaw right. Giles. Yes. Like, he takes his costume off to go yes. save the day, which is... Right. When he's Chainsaw Giles, it's much, much better. Chainsaw Giles, I mean, here for it. I love I love All Woodcutter right. Giles. Mm-hmm. 
making yes. a door. Woodcutter Giles is that whole thing. I love him as the woodcutter. I think it's so fantastic. I love the way that it feeds into the Little Red Riding Hood thing. Um, but just in general, give me Giles wielding a chainsaw. And uh, and I'm here for it. Here for it. <laughs> love it. Love every minute of it. I think it's great. Um so one of the other things, too, that we've got uh, going on here is the fear demon and these frat boys, right? You know, which we open up with the, if we cannot scare the young women, they will not fall into our arms. We will have womanless arms. Womanless oh, arms, man. My God. <laughs> I put forth that there is nothing on this earth that a straight man has not tried to use to get a woman into bed. For fuck's sake, guys, get a hobby. You know, play some <laughs> golf, whatever. I don't know. Um, and then there's the one guy who's like, is there any holiday holiday that's not about getting laid? And I'm like, yes, literally all of them are not about getting laid. Okay, maybe New Year's, but literally like all the rest. You know, Except are not Arbor about Day getting laid. It's just that they the use them for that. Answer. It is a great answer to that question. Right. It is great delivery. It is well written. I love that exchange. It is. Yes. It <laughs> like is. the way um, he says it. Arbor Day. Like, of course, yeah, everyone knows. Of course. The, the solemn Everybody and dignified Arbor, Arbor Day, Day is when we do not Arbor try to get sacred. women into bed. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Arbor Day is sacred. Flag Day, however, totally up for grabs. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So Flagpole <laughs> jokes abound. Uh, Come on. God. Of course, Arbor Day is all about wood. God damn it. Uh-huh. Oh. Uh, there, it is all about wood. Yeah, no, I'm telling you, there's nothing. There's nothing. <laughs> they take it that far. There's nothing. Um, and the guy who plays, I don't even remember the name of the character. It's just the douchebag. He's just douchebag McGee for me, like that guy. <laughs> the guy who ends up with his neck broken, you know, and I did not miss him, you know, yep. when that happened. Um, you know, we've got this this fear demon, right, who is playing on everybody's fears. You know, Willow's fear that she's a sidekick and her spell work isn't good enough. Xander's fear that he's invisible. Buffy that she's alone. Oz that he's a monster. And it's like a retread of what we did in the uh, season one episode Nightmares, right, where everybody yeah. had their worst fears. Also realized that's kind of somewhat similar. But I think it's kind of done better here. Did you like this better than Nightmares? I liked it differently from nightmares uh -huh. i really mm -hmm. like nightmares though. yeah <laughs> like <laughs> probably i like it probably more than i really should but that's mm -hmm. fine no i love the way i love the way their fears all play out i love the way that it becomes a haunted sentient house with the demon yes. in it. like it's mm -hmm. never really clear it's never totally explained and i don't care because i just love this right. idea of mm -hmm. them experiencing the thing that they are afraid of experiencing. Right. Yeah. And that the fear that, that Gaknar is feeding on those fears and those fears allow him to get stronger and become manifest, you know? And then he's um, so teeny. So kind of fun. <laughs> and then he's so teensy tiny. It's, and then he's so teensy tiny. It's like, it's like there's a metaphor here. Like the fear. Almost. The mm -hmm. fear is huge and all encompassing and reshapes the house. But the thing that's responsible but the for the reality it. of it is this yeah. little tiny shrimpy <laughs> it's just a little tiny shrimpy thing that you can just step on and smash with your kids yes. yeah so it's it's pretty cute um one thing too though that we get is uh, when buffy is in the basement right and she's being taunted by the resurrected dead body of douchebag mcgee right um he has this line where he says no matter how hard you fight you just end up in the same place i don't see why you bother and this speaks very directly to a theme that we see running through out uh, Buffy and, and very much over an angel, mm -hmm. right? Um, we get a lot of this over an, an angel. But we have Angel's speech from Gingerbread, right? Where he says, um, I do know it's important to keep fighting. I learned that from you. We never win. We never will. That's not why we fight. We do it because there's things worth fighting for, right? Um, then we get to the season two episode um, from the Angel series, uh, Epiphany, where he says, in the greater scheme, in the big picture, nothing we do matters. There's no grand plan, no big win. If there's there's no great glorious end to all of this. If nothing we do matters, then all that matters is what we do. And whenever I hear that line, it always gives me goosebumps. It is always so powerful to me. It is probably one of my favorite things in the whole Buffy verse is that idea. If nothing we do matters, then all that matters is what we yeah. do. And I think that that as a philosophical statement is so incredibly powerful. Um, but then we also have Buffy from Amends, right? When um, Angel is waiting for Sun to come up and he's basically committing suicide by uh, by Sun. Um, she says, strong is fighting. It's hard and it's painful and it's every day, but it's what we have to do. 
So it's this idea of you keep fighting, you keep fighting, you keep fighting, even though you're going to lose, even though most of the time you're going to lose, even though there's no great glorious end, there's no reward for winning the fight. You just keep fighting because there are things worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. So I love when we revisit that thematic hum within both Buffy and Angel about how important it is just that you fight. And to have that kind of touched on just briefly in this episode as part of Buffy's core fears, you know, that, that the fighting that she's doing doesn't make a difference. It doesn't do anything. I don't see why you bother. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think that that is really interesting. I really kind of liked that in this episode. And it feels so relevant to the world yes. we're living in 20 years later. It really, really does. Very important to keep fighting. All right. So, Noelle, what are you wearing? I'm wearing a costume. <laughs> a costume. <laughs> we talked about we talked about the costumes and just how yes. wonderful they are. Um, and I just, I mean, Halloween episodes, man. Halloween episodes. <laughs> I know. Halloween episodes. They are fantastic. All right. What's your girl power moment of the week? Okay. I kind of struggled to find one, but I do love the interaction between... Uh, James Bond, Xander, and Little Red Riding Hood yes. Buffy when he says, he's, he says, what you got in the basket, little girl? And she says, weapons. <laughs> and he just, right. okay, like, all right, game over, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. She wins. Yep. She wins that interaction. <laughs> yep. I don't feel like I need to ask you what your favorite part is. I think I know what your favorite part is. Oh, yeah, my favorite part is Chainsaw Giles. I mean, clearly, <laughs> Chainsaw Giles. He's so that delighted. is like when when he like comes into the attic and he like right through that, and you see him with the backlight with the chainsaw in his hand. I'm like, yep, gonna need a moment. That is just I love that. I love Giles. Giles delights me all the time. He just makes me really happy. So, what was your favorite moment? My what favorite, favorite moment is the conversation in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. Willow's telling Buffy that she knows when or she'll know when she's reached her limit and Oz yes. swoops in and then they have this conversation about magic and you know you didn't encourage her did you and it's right. a great and then the play on Oz being supportive versus concerned mm -hmm. and I just I love I love that whole interaction um, it's really good I love it I love it. I love it. I love it. I also love Mikasio as Sukasio. I know. <laughs> oh, Oz. Oh, Oz. <laughs> you ridiculous werewolf, you. <laughs> so delightful. It is really delightful. That's it for today. To join in the discussion on Twitter, follow Lonnie at Lonnie Diane Rich and me at Noelle Allowed and use the hashtag still pretty. Or you can keep Chipperish Media going to the tune of a dollar a month or more and gain access to the live chat and Discord where you can hang out with me and Noelle and all the Chipperish patrons who tend to hear the words people say and accept them at face value. You can also show your support by giving Still Pretty a great review on Apple Podcasts or by telling your friends about the show or by axe murdering Parker Abrams. Yes, I highly, highly support that last one. We will be back next time with Beer Bad, the fifth episode of season four. Until then, maybe it's just because of all the horrific things we've seen, but hippos wearing tutus just don't unnerve me the way they used to. <laughs>